Today, we're going to be talking about two specific tools that will help you develop the sustainability strategy for your company. Those tools are the stakeholder map and the value mapping tool. Let's start with the stakeholder mapping. This diagram will help us identify individuals or organizations that are of interest to the company. The stakeholder mapping tool was developed by Ron Mitchell and his colleagues in 1995 and has been very influential in defining stakeholders. All actors that can have an interest in the company or that can be affected by it are part of our stakeholders map. The scheme that you see on the screen will help us not only identify who those actors are, but also how to organize them. We would like to suggest that as a first step, you make a list of all actors that are of interest to the company. This list should be as extensive and as complete as you can make it. Traditionally, companies only identified those stakeholders directly linked to their operations, clients, shareholders, providers. Today, we know that there are a large list of actors, communities, governments, future generations. By including these additional actors, your strategy will not only be more complex, but it will also be more complete and more effective as it addresses its more relevant stakeholders. Thus, make an extensive list of all actors that could be involved with the company. This can be supplemented trying to answer the following questions. We would like to suggest that as a first step, you make a list of all actors that are of interest to the company. This list should be as extensive and as complete as you can make it. Traditionally, companies only identified those stakeholders directly linked to their operations, clients, shareholders, providers. Today, we know that there are a large list of actors, communities, governments, future generations. By including these additional actors, your strategy will not only be more complex, but it will also be more complete and more effective as it addresses its more relevant stakeholders. Thus, make an extensive list of all actors that could be involved with the company. This can be supplemented trying to answer the following questions. How do these actors affect my company? Can they improve or worsen my performance? You can also ask how is the company affecting those stakeholders? They might not seem too relevant to the performance of the company, but company actions can have a tremendous impact on the, those stakeholders. This happens, for instance, with neighboring communities. Sometimes companies arrive to a region and they positively or negatively affect the community. A company can have a positive impact when, for instance, the economic activity generates demand for local products and demand for labor. But it can also have a negative impact when the company competes for water or for other resources with local communities or when it deteriorates roads and infrastructure, generating conflict and pollution. Thus, for each one of the stakeholders you put on your list, ask yourselves, how are we affecting them? and how are they being affected by us. The next step is to organize them based on three main characteristics, power, legitimacy, and urgency. I will explain what we mean by each one of them. Let's go back to our Venn diagram. On the top, we have power. By power, I mean that there are actors that have the ability to change a company's behavior. Some of them have long-standing power, such as shareholders, while others can have only temporary power. For instance, when I'm making a decision on where to establish a facility, communities around the places that I'm considering can have power at specific moments in time because I depend on them to make some particular decisions. So power can be conceived as this ability of one actor to make another actor do something that she or he wouldn't do otherwise. And power can be brought by three different means. The first one is coercive, power that is exercised 
by means of physical resources, violence, or restraint. For example, in a country like Colombia, armed groups have exercised coercive power for a long time, and companies have seen the need to put those actors in their stakeholders' map, identifying the risk that they can pose for a company. Power can also be exercised by means of material or financial resources, that is called utilitarian power. This is the type of power I was referring to when I talk about the power of shareholders. Shareholders have resources invested in the company. They steer decisions and they can block or move a company by their wishes. But they are not the only ones. Clients also have utilitarian powers over the company. Finally, normative power means that there are norms or expected behaviors that a company should follow. Symbols of prestige or respect. There are actors, such as religious leaders, that can influence the behavior of a company without exercising force or without exercising control over the resources of a company. Many ethical activists appeal to these attributes to modify a company's behavior. Legitimacy, the second one of your Venn diagram circle, is another category that matters when classifying stakeholders. There are actors that give legitimacy while there are others that take it away. Legitimacy can be defined as the perception that the general public has over the actions of a company when they are deemed proper or desirable according to the collectively accepted norms and beliefs. A company that sells beauty products, for instance, can be legitimate among women given their benefits for skin health. But if the products are found to use animal intestine, producing harm to such beings, they might lose their legitimacy. Legitimacy is a door that actors open to companies in order to allow them to enter and operate in a market, a community, a country. Legitimacy can be analyzed at three levels, individual, organizational, or social. There are people, individuals, that can make a company more legitimate, for instance, the CEO. If his or her behavior is not perceived as appropriate, a company can lose legitimacy. Clients can also be a crucial source of legitimacy as they approve of a company's product. Organizations themselves generate trust and respect because of their actions, and they can be an important source for a company's legitimacy. Society as a whole can be a source of legitimacy as well. If I want to position my company in a country, I need to make sure that my products are socially accepted given the culture and the norms of the place. More and more companies are being asked to demonstrate how their internal culture adopts behavior that are deemed valuable to society, such as non-discriminatory practices, practices, sorry, Finally, at the bottom of our Venn diagram, we find urgency. Urgency will help us materialize how power and legitimacy play on in the relationship between a company and its actors. Urgency is how critical and how time sensitive the demands of the stakeholders are. Can they wait or this is an imminent risk? What are the consequences of doing nothing? How critical are their needs? So now, I have found whether my actors are powerful, legitimate, or have urgency. And then I can say that if they have these three characteristics, they are my definitive stakeholders, those at the center of the diagram in the area with the number seven. Not caring for their needs or their demands will critically endanger my operations. Thus, I can go back to the list of individuals and organizations and identify who are the most important ones, those that are on Area 7. Likewise, I can also identify those on, in Area 5, those that have power and urgency. 
they might or might not be part of my strategy. I need to monitor those actors because they're urgent and have power, although probably they're not legitimate. But at some point, I might have to respond to their needs. Also, there are actors, like the ones on area four, that are dominant. They affect my decision making. They might not have urgency, but they can exercise power and can be considered legitimate. So I need to think, for instance, of senior members of my board. They might be very influential. Their power and their legitimacy can help me with the decision making process. Maybe in the initial list, you identify some actors that do not seem that urgent or legitimate or that powerful. You can leave them in area 8, because we don't know yet for sure how they can impact my company or how the company can impact them. To better understand how to do this exercise, we're going to discuss a concrete example, so later you can do this map on your own organization. The example that we're going to use is the one of Nespresso, a spin-off of Nestlé. And we will see how Nespresso, the company that sells single-serve, high-quality coffee, will map its stakeholders to define its sustainability strategy. Following with the example of the company Nespresso, we proceed to analyze the environmental sustainability initiative that the company has been implementing. It is known that the pods or capsules that are used to store the coffee produce lots of waste. This initiative, as a consequence, focuses in recycling these capsules and educating the Nespresso's employees to implement sustainable practices in the company. As well, the company has focused its efforts in educating their customers in order to help with this recycling campaign. We now proceed to analyze how the stakeholder mapping tool works in a company such as Nespresso. We first do a list of all the possible stakeholders of the company. And then we proceed to ask ourselves, how do they affect the company? How are they affected by the company? What is their power over the company? What is their urgency and legitimacy? We now have as an example, the pot suppliers, which are considered discretionary stakeholders. These stakeholders are the ones in charge of the production of the capsules that contain Nespresso's products. Recyclable, because in this aspect is where the company has focused its main value, is in consumption and taking care of the environment. We go ahead and ask ourselves, how do they affect Nespresso? The quality of Nespresso's product depends on the quality of these capsules. They need to be able to preserve properly the product until it reaches the customer. As well, the contamination that is produced by the capsules depends on how good are the practices and processes that are being used in this production and also the awareness from Nespresso of the care that the environment requires. Now, how are they affected by Nespresso? Nespresso imposes quality standards, which promotes innovation and development for the company. These suppliers have low power and urgency over the company due to the fact that they do not take part in the decisions of Nespresso. Every condition is imposed over them and they are easily replaceable. On the other hand, they have high legitimacy because they have to follow environmental requirements in their practices in order to continue developing as sustainable products and eco-friendly. Because of all this, 
This group of stakeholders are considered discretionary. Nespresso towards this group must continue demanding and promoting quality and sustainability. Referring now to neighboring communities, which are considered dependent stakeholders, we can describe them as people that for any reason live close to the points where Nespresso works. How do they affect Nespresso? They demand the minimization of negative effects over the population caused by Nespresso's work. How are they affected by Nespresso? The company can bring development and work to this population. Nevertheless, the consequences can be negative and damage such population. These people have no power over the company, but they have high urgency to be heard and attended by the company due to the fact that they have the capacity of interrupting Nespresso's labor and jeopardize the security of workers and the company as a whole. They also have high legitimacy because they are the principal agents in the capacity of saying if the company is being responsible or not. For all this, we can say that neighboring communities are dependent stakeholders, and towards such group, Nespresso must warranty their security, generate opportunities, and respect their rights. At last, we talk about clients which are considered definitive stakeholders. These are the direct consumers of Nespresso's products, are people with enough capital to purchase premium coffee and the machines needed to prepare such product. How do they affect Nespresso? They have absolute power over the demand. Their preferences are going to determine what is that the company must and mustn't produce and in which quantity they should do it. How are customers affected by Nespresso? Nespresso's products are consumption products. For this reason, there is many things to take into account. First, these people's lifestyles change once they start consuming products of this brand. They exit a traditional market of regular coffee and hot beverages into a new market of premium quality beverages of automatic preparation. As well, the customer health is in stake due to the fact that it could be affected by the consumption of any of these products or the waste they cause. At last, Customers can be affected by the possible price variation that the company presents to the market. Because if being too extreme, this could result in many customers not being able to purchase Nespresso's products. Clients are considered to have high power in the company. Nespresso needs them to be active in order to activate the company itself because the demand in the market is going to depend on their preferences, which is also going to determine the production and the strategies for the company. They also have high urgency because their preferences are very changeable, and if they are not satisfied, they could stop buying products from Nespresso. At last, they have high legitimacy because they are every time more sophisticated and critic. For this reason, They demand practices and products with additional benefits than quality. If the company don't pay attention to this group of stakeholders, a crisis would be imminent because they wouldn't be given importance to those who buy their products. For all this, clients can be determined as definitive stakeholders and towards this group, Nespresso must try to supply all their needs and adapt to every change and preference in the demand. Nespresso also have to be able to attend any question or complaint 
presented by the clients. And at last, they should be able to offer technical support for the machines and other products sold by Nespresso. The second tool we're going to explain is value mapping. This tool has been developed by Nancy Boken, and it is a tool designed to help companies identify what they're doing well, what negative externalities are they producing and have not managed, and where do they have the greatest opportunities to generate value. If you look at this diagram, you realize that the basis of this map is the stakeholder mapping. This is why we started with the stakeholder map. I place all my definitive stakeholders around the wheel and ask myself questions that relate to those stakeholders. In the center of the diagram, I locate the purpose of the organization. Then, I ask myself what value do I create and who captures that value. Then, I ask myself what value do I destroy or what negative externalities is my company producing. Thirdly, I ask myself what value opportunities am I missing, value that is being created but no one captures, and finally, I ask myself for opportunities of new or additional value creation. This map is based on three main concepts. Value proposition, that is, what is my product or service and what value generates to consumers, society and the environment. Is it a healthier product, a more convenient service? I need to ask, what are the market segments I relate to? Is it the same value for everyone? A Yoplait yogurt generates the same value to the mother who buys it for her kid's lunchbox and to the boy who drinks it at school? The mother is looking for a nutritious and convenient solution, while the child must be looking for a sweet, enjoyable product. This segmentation is based on my stakeholders map. You need to ask, what value do I create, for whom, and how do I deliver that value? I develop activities such as marketing, promotion. I use resources to develop and deliver my product. I need suppliers and other allies to distribute value. My product relies on technologies and other features to help the customer and other stakeholders capture value. Take for instance microcredit. When I provide a service like this one, I need to ask myself, are my clients capturing all the value they could? Am I reaching all my customers? Are they taking full advantage of the service to create a new business, to access formal financial services for the first time, to create a credit history, to improve his or her quality of life? I might try to create a good product but I need to know who is capturing the value and whether they are capturing all the value my product is intended to offer. Finally, is my company able to capture value? A company can be doing some philanthropical activities without capturing any value, by donating books or fixing a school. But if the company does not capitalize on this action, the children can capture value, but the company might not be capturing any. With these three concepts, value creation, value delivery, and value capture, we will map our value tool using Boken's proposal. Here again, we will use Nespresso to illustrate how to use the tool. To summarize, I first must draw all the definitive stakeholders around the map. Second, I identify my purpose at the center. What value is my company creating? Thirdly, what value each one of my stakeholders is capturing? Shareholders, clients. Fourthly, what value is my company destroying? Am I generating pollution to communities, future generations? Fifthly, what value am I missing by not reaching all my stakeholders? Or some of the most critical. For instance, people who are too poor or too distant to benefit from my product. And finally, I analyze the more distant circle. How can my product generate new value? Should I add other services to help some stakeholders gain additional value? Thus, the sustainability strategy should be focusing on filling the gaps to reduce value loss, turn value destruction into value creation, and create new value. Let's implement now the value mapping tool in Nespresso. A clear example of value capture could be the education given to Nespresso's workers in order for them to produce their recognized premium coffee.
with this training and education to agents capture value. First, the company, because they are able of getting more benefit and profit from this premium product. And on the other hand, the producer are now going to be able to differentiate their product from the competence. Now, referring to an example of value destroyed, it's clear that the critics made by environmental communities and NGOs because of the contamination that Nespresso was causing made the company destroy their reputation and the value. As a consequence, the company started to miss value And an example of this could be that the quality perception that existed in the customer started to get damaged because of the environmental problems of the company. This made the customers to change their mind and start considering whether to continue buying or stop Nespresso's products. This caused that the company lost a significant part of its demand and couldn't sell as much as it expected. All these combined lead the company to the opportunities of creating new value. Clear examples of these could be the implementation of recycling campaigns that would reduce the negative impact in the environment that the company is causing, and also the continuation of policies that make the customer be aware of the quality and benefits of Nespresso's products. Now we invite you to implement these tools in your flower companies.